Well, here we are, and you've come back for some reason. I'm glad you did. Uh, my name is Cameron Miller, and this is a sermon on uh, the readings from the Revised Common Lectionary for the 23rd week of Pentecost, and this is from Trinity Place in Geneva, New York. Uh, and it includes, of course, the uh, reading from the Book of Ruth and from Mark, and also a poem by Mary Oliver. In ancient Israel, uh, and reportedly still today, I'm sorry to say, careful distinctions were made between people who belonged and did not belong, including between a foreigner and a sojourner. Both were aliens, most likely immigrants from such nearby places as Cana and Moab, but a sojourner referred to someone from the outside who had settled down and made their home among the Israelites. Even though they were still not considered an Israelite, sojourners were treated as what we might think about today as people who hold a green card or DACA kids. Foreigners, on the other hand, were met with less graciousness. Now it's amazing to me that Ruth became a book of the Bible because it's about a foreigner one held, even so, as an icon of faithfulness, and who then went on to become the great-grandmother of King David. So it's a story from a time before the Exodus, and before the, I'm sorry, after the Exodus, and before the monarchy, but it's actually written many centuries later. It comes from a time after the exile, and it seems to have been written to argue with the books of Ezra and Nehemiah that opposed marriage to foreigners. So it presented a counter-argument. And it's a great and fascinating story, to be, tr to be sure, with a woman as a hero, which is uncharacteristic. But it does nothing to hide how marginalized and vulnerable women were within a misogynistic social caste system, nor does it advocate for something different. The whole book is like a page and a half or something like that. It's pretty short. So what I want to suggest is you go home and, and you read it and then you can tell people that you read a whole book of the Bible today. But I want to turn the page to Mark and Mary. Mary Oliver, that is. Like you, I have many neighbors. Some of them are people with whom I share core political and economic values. Some of them are people with whom I share some values. And some of them, I suspect, are people with whom I hold uh, little in common except cordialness and shared geography. Jesus wants me to love every one of them. Heck, I want to love each of them, theoretically. <laughs> Actually, I do love each of them to the extent that I know them. I do love them, at least intellectually. But Jesus wants me to love each one of them, as we heard in the Gospel of Mark today. I want to begin, though, with Mary Oliver talking about Jesus and love. And she writes this in part. Imagine him speaking. And don't worry about what is reality, or what is plain, or what is mysterious. If you were there, it was all those things. If you can imagine it, it is all those things. Eat, drink, be happy. Accept the miracle. Accept, too, each spoken word spoken with love. Well, this so-called great commandment from Jesus is one we like to argue and quibble about. We like to kind of smooth the corners and see if we can make it fit reality, change its roundness to fit into our squareness. Unlike so much of Jesus, which is often way too radical for us even to talk about, we can almost make this one fit. Almost. But let's not. Let's try treating this great commandment to love one another 
like communion. Let's try not thinking about it, but experiencing it. Let's try swallowing it whole and imagining how life would be different if we were able to do it. Or as Mary Oliver wrote, if you were there, it was all those things. If you can imagine it, it is all those things. Let's receive the great commandment like the bread and allow it to dissolve on our tongue and not think about whether it's actually the body of Christ or not. Let's just do it. Swallow it whole. And how? And know that we'll be better for it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I can't do it either. There's an interesting difference between Matthew, Mark, and Luke's uh, telling of this teaching or how they frame this teaching. In each of them, it's generally surrounded by conflict the Pharisees and temple clergy arguing with Jesus or trying to trap him into saying something that will get him arrested. The, layer, the lawyers nitpick and push and prod. The clergy sniff around and act passive-aggressively. The people wait to see what will happen. But in Mark, with this particular teaching, a scribe seems to ask about it sincerely. And at the end, he's so authentic and open to it, Jesus praises him. Yeah, you, you get it, Jesus says with a smile. You are very close. But I'm, I'm guessing that you and I are not so close. I don't want to put words into your mouth or thoughts into your brain. But I think we get tripped up on three things here in this great commandment. We read them and hedge our bets and say, yes, yes, but. First, we want, uh, we want neighbor to be defined a little bit more narrowly, please. And secondly, and ironically, we want to keep the focus on loving our neighbor rather than on loving ourselves because, well, I don't really want to get into it because, well, because of our difficulty loving ourselves and how personal that is. And third, love God with all the heart, with all the mind, with all the soul. <laughs> that seems a little extreme. How are we going to love God like that and make money? Or better yet, how are we going to spend money? I guess when we break it down like that into its constituent parts, we might have trouble with the whole thing. You better go back to swallowing it whole with mindless acceptance. Now, I know that there are people you do not love. Mm -hmm. I know that because I believe you and I are not that different. And for sure, there are people I don't love. There are some people who do things and espouse things and contribute to things I find repugnant. I would have to cheat on the test in order to say that I love them. Maybe you're different than me, I don't know. But I'm guessing that most of you are not. What do we do with this hardcore resistance to Jesus that hides inside of us? Well, here's what. We keep swallowing his teachings, crazy and as absurd as they are. We keep swallowing them whole right along with the communion bread. <laughs> Look, let's get real. What do we have inside? What do we have inside of ourselves if our religion is ideology? Political ideology. What do we have inside, inside ourselves, if our religion is patriotism and nationalism? What do we have inside of ourselves if our religion is racial and ethnic identity? What do we have inside of ourselves if our religion is fidelity to an economic system? What do we have inside ourselves 
if our religion is the self. If every one of those, in every one of those religions, love has boundaries, love is transactional, and love is a zero-sum game. Jesus is talking about love, real love, as in loving God. Jesus doesn't prescribe niceness. <laughs> no. Jesus does not tell us we have to like people who act like jerks. Jesus does not tell us that we have to allow ourselves to be victimized by people who do not love us or who love us badly. Jesus does tell us we need to be about loving our neighbor as ourselves. And by the way, for all practical purposes, that's also how we love God with our whole heart, by loving our neighbor and ourselves. Loving our neighbor means resisting the urge to hate. Loving ourselves means extending ourselves mercy when we feel ashamed. Loving our neighbor means sharing what we have in abundance with those who are in need, no matter what, how or why they got to be in need. Loving ourselves means accepting what we wish was different with a heart of generosity. Loving our neighbor means accepting our differences and celebrating them where we can. Because love is a verb, what Jesus is poking us to do is act in particular ways that may or may not reflect how we feel. We may feel repulsed and angry and offended by someone's political viewpoint, but we can still act in such a way that respects their dignity and embraces their humanity. When we swallow Jesus whole in the bread or in his teaching, then we have him inside agitating us, guiding us, poking us, poking us to resist our resistance to act in love. When we have Jesus' great commandments as our religion inside, our neighbor might not be better, but we will be. It's about how we act, not how we feel. It's about how we treat ourselves and one another, not what we believe. And with that, I will wish you a gracious peace and a wonderful day. Take care.